Good morning. We're glad you've joined us for the Sunday morning service of Tusculum Hills Baptist Church, a caring and vibrant church that offers God's help to all people. We invite you to join us now for a special message from God's Word from Pastor Paul Gunn. The title of my message today is Matthew, From Counting Coins to Counting the Cost. And I will be preaching from Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 10, and I'll mention Luke chapter 14 as well. I have three points to today's sermon. They are the same points as last week's sermon. First, Matthew was given a new life. Second, Matthew was given a new calling. And third, God offers us the same. I trust that the words of Scripture and the words of the message today will inspire you and help you get to thinking. I'm reminded of a seminary professor many years ago who talked about preaching, my preaching professor. Uh, He mentioned that uh, when he was a younger man, he worked really hard to make his messages uh, academic and intellectually stimulating, challenging people to think on an academic deep level. And then one Sunday he looked out and he saw a man who was a nuclear physicist dozing off. And he knew he was tired. And he looked around and he saw other people that were tired. And he realized that Sunday morning is not the best time to go deep, deep into things and get people thinking on that academic level because they're tired. So it changed the direction of his preaching. And his preaching became a little more simplified and inspirational. So I hope that this morning's message will inspire you. And again, this is the second sermon in our new series called Fresh Starts and New Beginnings. I remember a marquee that I saw a couple of years ago that said, Oh God, of second chances, here I am again. Don't we all need fresh starts and new beginnings? I remember as a younger man, I asked an older man, when do you quit doing stupid things? And I had done a series of just stupid things, and he said, well, you never quit doing those things. You do less of them as you get older. They're just worse. (laughs) We all need fresh starts and new beginnings. Read with me if you will. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew was given a new life. I'll begin with verse 9. The scripture says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Matthew was a tax collector. And he worked in the area of Capernaum under the Roman authority. Tax collectors in that day were about as popular as tax collectors are today. But actually, they were even less popular. They were even less accepted. If you know somebody who works for the IRS, then you would probably say they're just doing their job. Tax collectors... In this day, in this culture, were Jews who worked for the Roman government. The Jews were living under Roman oppression at the time. And that alone would have made them unfavorable in the eyes of their peers. But unfortunately, there were other reasons to dislike them. 
tax collectors extracted more money from the people than was required. They increased the already burdensome taxes in order to line their own pockets. And my understanding of the day was that the Roman government didn't really care how taxes were collected. They just wanted the taxes. So tax, tax collectors took advantage of that. So if you owed 75, let's say, dollars to the Roman government, a tax collector might charge you $100 and keep the difference for himself. Everyone knew it. Needless to say, as a tax collector, Matthew would have been an unpopular pick for a disciple. Now you see in the scripture that when Jesus had supper with Matthew, there were other tax collectors uh, present. Do you know why there were other tax collectors present? Present, because they couldn't eat with anybody else. <laughs> they had to eat with like cheaters. Matthew was not the only tax collector, though, who became a follower of Christ. You may remember another famous tax collector, Zacchaeus. In Luke chapter 19, we, we read about Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector who wanted to see Jesus. And we know how he climbed that tree to see Jesus. Some of you can sing that children's song right now. Jesus not only saw Zacchaeus, Jesus invited himself to Zacchaeus' house for lunch. And that day, Zacchaeus renounced his sin and was saved. Tax collectors were so hated among the Jewish people that, that like the word Gentile, the term tax collector became synonymous with sin or a sinful life. So tax collectors would have been referred to as a group of sinners. Can you imagine that? Just a group, a whole profession known among the Jewish people is just a group of sinners, just like dogs, like the Gentiles. And Jesus did not deny the sins of Matthew other tax collectors as he had supper with them. Of course, the tax collectors were sinners, but unlike the religious elite who did not want to admit their own sin, we find that Matthew and Zacchaeus recognized that they were indeed sinners. Well, so we see that when, when Jesus called Matthew... And Matthew followed Jesus. He was given a new life. I'll say more about that toward the end of the message, but I want to move on. Next, I want you to see that Matthew was given a new calling. Matthew chapter 10, turn the page there, starting with verse 1. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease, and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew the tax collector. There he was, Matthew the tax collector. <laughs> James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. It's interesting how that uh, Matthew, when he writes his, writes his own gospel, doesn't really go into the professions or much descriptions of, of the other apostles, but he calls himself the tax collector. And he references Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. So the only two of these that had descriptors were Matthew, putting himself on that same level, in a manner of speaking, from a literary point of view, with Judas. Matthew never forgot what the Lord called him out of. The story of Matthew's call to discipleship is included in the books of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But interestingly, neither Mark nor Luke call Matthew by his name, by this name. Both, both of those authors, that is Mark or Luke, call him Levi. And they, they don't also, they don't directly connect him with being a tax collector. Instead, Mark says that Levi was sitting at his tax booth. And Luke says that Jesus called the tax collector named Levi. 
And these may seem like unimportant details, but when we think about Matthew's story, we discover that they're not. As a tax collector, Matthew would have been considered one of the greatest sinners of, among all sinners. And if, if Jesus had taken a poll before calling Matthew, it's unlikely that any of the other disciples would have voted to have this, these, this man join their tribe. However, by the time, think about this, by the time Mark and Luke penned their Gospels, no doubt Matthew had grown on them. They had become like brothers. They had spent a lot of time together. So it, it makes sense that Mark and Luke would, have, would be cautious about how they referred to Matthew's previous life. And they didn't even call him by, by his name Matthew. They called him by Levi. They were being gracious to him. Yet in his own writings, Matthew did not take the same measures. He refers to himself by his Greek name and makes no attempt to hide who he once was. And when Matthew records the names of the disciples, he lists himself here as Matthew the tax collector. Matthew wanted people to know who he was so they would recognize how far he had come because of Jesus. Listen to this. There were two brothers named Ben and Thomas. Ben, the older brother, was a star athlete. He loved to be on the team as long as it was a winning team. And even though, even though Ben was very talented, he did not mind sitting on the bench as long as his team was in the lead. Thomas, on the other hand, did not think sitting on the bench was very fun. He did enjoy winning, but he did not mind losing if personally he believed he had played a good game. And the object of the game to Thomas was to play well and to have fun. Let me tell you a secret. If you're a Christian, you are on the winning team. And let me share with you another secret. On this team, there are no bench warmers. The whole team needs to play. You see, Jesus did not just call Matthew out of the tax collector's booth. He called him to something meaningful. He called him to, to, to say goodbye to his old way of life and take on a whole new life. He called him to join the team, to be a disciple. And of course, we recognize that the disciples had a, had a special role in the ministry of Jesus they, they taught and testified about Jesus, but Matthew had another role as well. Right here in chapter 10, the scripture tells us that Jesus gave them all the authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Who wouldn't want to trade tax collecting for that? He got a whole new job. He also wrote what would become the first book of the New Testament. And, and here's something interesting to note. I want you to hear this. The book of Matthew talks more about money than any of the other Gospels. And it makes, it makes sense given Matthew's previous career. You see, Matthew did not have to, have to forget his history in order to serve the Lord. Jesus empowered Matthew to use his history to fulfill his call. So this disciple, Matthew, previously known as a cheater for the Roman government, now used money as illustrations in the book that he wrote. In fact, there are 44 at least references to money or fairness in the book of Matthew as compared to six references to money or fairness in the book of Mark and 22 in the book of Luke. We know some of those. Matthew spoke about the temple tax. And he, he spoke of the generous and debt-forgiving heart of God. One Christian writer picked up on this and noticed how Matthew wrote down the prayer of Jesus that we call the Lord's Prayer. He put the Lord's Prayer down this way. He wrote, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And Luke's version reads, forgive our sins, which we translate as 
trespass. So money, while he gave up tax collecting, he didn't give up thoughts about money. It's just that now his thoughts about money and fairness were righteous. So God redeemed him. Do you see? God is in the redemption business. I believe the ap application here is good. So l listen to this. Because of the Lord's calling in his life, he surrendered his money-making career. He became a follower of Jesus. In his past life before Jesus, he cheated people. In his new life uh, after Jesus told him to follow me, he became concerned about fairness. And many of you, many of you here today, you don't want to talk about your past before you came to faith in Jesus, and that is understandable. But it goes to reason that when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, your past no longer defined you, but now you have a new perspective about your past and about your future. It's called redemption. <laughs> and for Matthew, the past of cheating was reborn into a life of valuing forgiveness. Isn't that beautiful? So we see that Matthew was given a new life. Matthew was given a new calling. And we also see that God offers us the same. Look in cha Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Starting with verse 28, the scripture says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, ridicule you saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Counting the cost of being a disciple. I've been to the Bahamas several times and I've noted how they build homes there. Here, uh, there's codes, permits, a person has to have a construction loan, then permanent financing. In the Bahamas, they don't have uh, FHA and bank loans in the same way that we do, so people have to have all their cash up front to build a house. Many homes are unfinished because when people started building, they didn't count the total cost. Some of those homes are built over time on purpose. The foundation is laid, there's solid concrete, and all the, the, uh, the pipes are roughed in, and then a few years later, the family will have saved enough money to build the walls, and so the walls are visible there, just concrete block walls for several years, and then they'll finish up the house, but there are some that never went beyond the initial concrete foundation because the builders did not consider the cost. And we like to talk about how easy salvation it is sometimes and, and it is easy because of the work that Jesus did for us but when we read this passage of scripture we are reminded that there is a cost. Salvation is a free gift that is given in exchange for our old lives. Jesus wants our whole selves when Jesus called Matthew he didn't say hey Matthew keep doing what you're doing keep cheating people and then every now and then uh, check in with me <laughs> he did not allow him that he didn't even it wasn't even part of the story in any way there has to be a crucifixion before there can be a resurrection there has to be a death to the old self before there can be 
a life, a new life, a new calling, a new direction. Before Matthew, Zacchaeus, or anyone else could be resurrected into a new life, they had to die to themselves. Matthew left the tax collector's booth and became a disciple. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, returned to his job but conducted business in a whole new and morally acceptable way. There's a story about a a little girl who had a favorite necklace. It was a cheap plastic necklace that looked a little bit like her mother's pearls. (laughs) And the little girl wore the necklace every day, everywhere she went. And after a long period of time, her father said to her, Do you love me? And the little girl said, Yes, Daddy, I love you. And then he said, Then give me your necklace. And then she replied, But Daddy, you know that I love this necklace. And so the father didn't argue with her, and some time would pass. And then he would ask her again, Do you love me? And she would say yes, and then he would say, well, give me your necklace. And she did not want to take off her necklace. And finally, one night when he said it, she handed the necklace to her dad. And that night, he gave her a genuine pearl necklace in return. You see, he wanted the old, cheap, junky necklace that she loved so that he could give her something so much better something so much more beautiful. And she loved the new necklace. Christ, Christ is the pearl of great price. Imagine if that daddy had given the the little girl a new necklace without taking away the old. She might not have understood the value of the real necklace. (laughs) She, She may have wanted to wear both right alongside one another. And that's the way some people treat Jesus. We, we try to wear our salvation like an old coat over the top of our stained and sinful hearts. And Jesus, Jesus didn't come to cover us up. He came to make us new. He did not come to tell Matthew to continue, continue in his sinful ways. What if he had done that? What a terrible testimony Matthew would have had. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I still intentionally cheat people. Won't you become a follower of Jesus too? I mean, no change is ridiculous, absurd. You know, if there's, if there's no change life, then there's probably been no salvation. Jesus reminded the Pharisees in the scripture that I read to you that sick people need a doctor. Sinners need a Savior. That's what Jesus was saying. Sinners need a Savior. And the same is true today. We're going through the Romans road in our scripture memory time on purpose. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every human is born into sin. We are sinners by nature. And we are also sinners by choice. Sin separates us from this holy God. Therefore, as a result of our physical and spiritual condition, we are destined to die. Our bodies will die. And without Christ, we will be forever separated from God, the giver and the sustainer of life. And Jesus calls us to repent of our sins in the same way that he called Matthew And he said, follow me. He wants us to follow him. He promises that that when we ask, he is ready to forgive. But Jesus does not just call us away from something. He calls us to something. He calls us to a new life in him. A life with purpose. A life with meaning. So we see that Matthew was given a new life. Matthew was given a new calling. God offers us the same. But there's more to the story with Matthew's calling and the rest of the disciples. It was the dream of a 
of a Jewish boy's family for their son to follow a rabbi. History tells us that boys would approach a rabbi when their parents thought that they were ready and the rabbi would quiz the boys and then the the rabbi would say either follow me or return to your father's profession. And it's it's, it's likely that the disciples of Rabbi Jesus had already been rejected by other rabbis earlier in their lives. So when Jesus called out to Matthew, follow me, this was Matthew's second chance. This was the dream of his life to be called by a rabbi. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that probably had passed once and he was getting it again. The desire to hear the words, follow me from Jesus, were so strong that Matthew left the tax booth never to return. The title of the message today is is about, about Matthew is from counting coins to counting the cost. Matthew recorded these words. In chapter 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Matthew went from counting coins to counting the cost. I imagine that if Matthew could be here today, he'd tell us the cost was absolutely nothing in return for what he received. It wasn't easy. History tells us that the disciples died martyrs' deaths. Jesus has made the same offer to each one of us. He does not want to just save us from from hell, from an eternity in hell, although that's part of us. He wants to save us for a lifetime of hope and a lifetime of purpose. What about you? Have you surrendered your life to God? Or are you like the the little girl holding on to the cheap imitation necklace? God wants so badly to give you salvation through his son Jesus. Maybe you, you know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you gave him your heart and life years ago. But today as time has passed, you've realized that you've slipped back into the old patterns of sin. Don't let the world tempt you with fool's gold. (laughs) Don't let the world tempt you with fake, easy, cheap, believism, Christianity, which is going to take lots and lots of people to an eternity without Christ. Christ has a purpose for you, and he has a plan for you in this kingdom. Would you please bow your heads as we go to the Lord in prayer here? I would like to ask you to... Examine yourself with this question, do I know Jesus as my Lord and Savior?